All right, I want to make a just a quick video here, just going over this uh, zombie doctrine of a millennial reign, which is not found in the Bible at all. And it's interesting to me because it's almost like a entirely different religion. So this idea of a millennial reign is only found in Revelation 20. You're not going to find it anywhere else. In fact. When it talks about the thousand years, it very clearly, very simply says they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So it's talking about us that are born of God living and reigning with Christ right now. And of course, I have to bring up this point. If Jesus is not reigning in your life right now, how can you rightly say that you're saved? You can't. We're a priest of God and of Christ right now. We are a royal priesthood and holy nation. Okay? And shall reign with him. We reign with him right now. All right. It's a special, unique time period from the time of baby Jesus to the time of his return. That's all it is. All right. It's not a reign. And this idea, uh, the idea of reign is in vain. Jesus reigns forever. I don't know how you can dispute that. You can't. So all you have to do is, all you do is speak in ignorance when you speak of this idea of a millennial reign. That's not found in the Bible anywhere. It's not in Revelation 20. It's not found anywhere at all. So I have not listened to what this guy says in this particular video. I've covered him before. And of course, this gentleman, just a refresher, reminder, believes that the resurrection has already happened, the end of the world has already happened, and there, there's nothing of any value at all in the Bible. Everything's already happened. And um, so uh, I, <laughs> it, it, what he teaches doesn't make sense, but what he's teaching, a lot of people believe and teach. It is written, understanding the timing of the millennial reign, do you believe the Bible, or are you following the traditions of man? This is a question most Christians would boldly pro proclaim the answer to be the Bible, solo scriptura. They would pride themselves on their knowledge of the Bible, as explained to them by their pastors. Okay, so anyways, it, what's interesting is about the solo scriptura, whatever, um, sola scriptura, people that proclaim the scriptures only, the, from my experience, don't believe in any scripture at all. It's interesting to me. Now, again, I believe the King James Bible is not a translation. It's not a version. It is the perfect, pure word of God in the English language. Uh, scripture only, solo scripture. It's a. It sounds nice. It sounds cool. But do you really believe that to be true? If you believe the scripture only, then show me what scripture you believe. Or, you know, because there's a whole lot of people out there that don't believe in any Bible at all. They don't believe in a Greek Bible. They don't believe in a Hebrew Bible. They don't believe in an Aramaic or Arabic Bible. They don't believe in an um, Ethiopian Bible. They don't believe in an English Bible. They don't believe in any Bible anywhere, any time in human history. Yet they proclaim the Sola Scriptura. And it's interesting to me. It just I just want to point that out. They would pride themselves on their knowledge of the Bible, as explained to them by their pastors. If they are challenged with a thought that isn't in line with their current understanding, they would be quick to reference someone more learned or better yet, a trusted commentary of the Bible. And, if asked to personally explain a passage that is perplexing, their trust in the scholars becomes paramount. Yeah, so that's a problem. I agree with him on that. It's a problem when people think of others as experts. They're putting men before God. That's a problem. Absolutely, absolutely uh, agree with that. And of course, what I what I'll tell you is that if you 
have 100% faith in the Bible that you hold in your hands, you have access to everything. And no man has greater access than you. Okay? Surely there must be a translation problem here. Some contextual issue. So, okay, so that's, here we go. Here lies the problem, the translation problem. Uh, the, the Bible is not a translation. Alright, and, I mean, either that, <clears throat> excuse me, either that or everything, <laughs> everything is a translation. Alright, and I'll, I'll prove that to you. Bone of my bones. This is the Adam in the Garden of Eden said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. This was not written in Hebrew, or this was, I'm sorry, this was not spoken in Hebrew. It's written in English, right? It's written in Hebrew, it's written in all languages. But it's not, it was not spoken in Hebrew. We learn that by reading Genesis 11. Now, either believe the Bible or you don't. At Genesis 11, God confounded the language. There was one original language, and God confounded that. And after he confounded it, nobody spoke that or understood that language ever again. Therefore, when Adam said, this is now bone of my bones, he was speaking a language that no man knows today. All right, so you could argue everything's a translation. That's fine. But I contend that the Word of God lasts forever in all languages, for all time, forever and ever. Okay, let's continue. Issues that can be sorted out by the modern-day high priests. All right, modern-day high priests. If you are born of God, you are a royal priest. Okay. But today, put their trust in their pastor's understanding of the Bible. They believe he has some 5G super holy connection to God that exceeds their own Wi-Fi speeds. They believe he spends more time right. studying and has made all the connections for the people. And has been gifted specifically. Okay, so we're a minute in. He's not, he's not making any point. He's reading something. So let me go ahead and explain the understanding, the timing, <clears throat> excuse me, of the end of the world. And in Revelation 20, in this mention, the end of the world is verse 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat upon it, in whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. Alright, so, if we go to Matthew 24, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. Jesus explains the end of the world better than anybody, and he puts it so simply. And we read here, He's asked, What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And first of all, it's important, I've got to share this. The very first thing he says, Take heed that no man deceive you. All right, now we scroll on down to 29, 30, and 31. When the sun is darkened, the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven. And the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. This is parallel with what we read here in verse 11, and I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it whose face the earth and heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. Directly parallel, directly connected. All you have to do is connect the dots. The sun shall be dark and the moon shall not give her light. The stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaking. shaken. Whose face the earth and heaven fled away. All right, And this is when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. There is not 2, 3, 4, 22, 26 times when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. It's one time. All you have to do is connect the dots. In order to connect the dots, you have to have faith. you got to believe. And not just faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, but faith in the Word of God, the Bible that you hold in your hands. All right, so this is Jesus coming in the clouds of heaven. All right, this is Judgment Day. And Judgment Day is, are you saved or are you not saved? It's that simple. That's Judgment. All 
right and this is and again just in case you lose your train of thought I want to emphasize that when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven that is judgment day it's the end of the world it's all the same thing all right now I've heard people try to make this out to be different events it's not and it might sell books and people might eat it up I get it but it's not the truth all right so when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, it's judgment day. The judgment is, are you saved or are you not saved? All right, we can go back to, I think it's Matthew 13. Let me let me figure this out here. Uh, wait and tear. Okay. Matthew 13 gives a parable of the wheat and tear. All right, so what happens uh, come harvest time? Um, let's do it this way. And what happens at the harvest, the end of the world? Did you, did you see the connection there? Um, Matthew thirteen verse thirty nine, the end of the world. Matthew twenty four, verse three, end of the world. Are you seeing the connection? Connect the dots, man. Connect the dots. The end of the world is the harvest, and the harvest will gather up the wheat, but the tares will be thrown in the fire. It's that simple. Saved unsaved that's the judgment of God should be no doubt about it all right and of course 31 is the gathering together of the elect and of course this is a fulfillment of uh, you know, goes all the way back to Genesis 3 we are lifted up at the last trump um, at the last trump we are um, what is that verse uh, we are Lifted up first the dead in Christ and those of us which are alive and remain shall be caught up with them To meet the Lord in the air and then our enemy is gathered at our feet I'm telling you this is all consistent all throughout the Bible. This is not a one-time deal this is all throughout the Bible and Gather them together all right gather the Satan is loosed the why is Satan loosed at the end of the thousand years so he can go out deceive the nations to gather them together and then fire comes down from God so we're up in the air when this happens at the last trump we are lifted up we are changed in the twinkling of an eye we are up in the air with the Lord and fire comes down from God out of heaven and destroys our enemy forever that is at our feet all right, that's the same as God stomping his foot on the head of the serpent, which we read about in Genesis 3. It's the same, same thing. All right, let's go do it this way. Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So when this happens, it's the end of the world. All death, all sin... All wickedness is done away with forever at that moment in time. It's over. It's finished. It's all done away with forever. And again, I want to remind you, this is at the end of the world. This is when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. It's over. It's over. Death and hell and all of that is done away with forever it's the end of the world and now begins our world of everlasting life with a new heaven and a new earth and so on and so forth we get great detail on that too but make no mistake about it when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven it is the end of the world and death is uh, destroyed forever all right I mean so that's it that's as simple as it gets now the, you got all these lunatics out there that are teaching uh, that well Jesus comes in the clouds then there's a thousand year period of zombie visions and you got zombies running around there unsaved people and death reigning and hell still not destroyed Jesus failed apparently according to this doctrine that when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven it's not the end of the world we're gonna see another dispensation you know just like the, what the Mormons teach you know that hey you're gonna be trans um, you're gonna be 
you know, sent off to another planet. You're going to be Jesus of that planet, and you're going to have sex with all the virgins in that planet. <clears throat> I mean, that's what they're teaching, is it not? And, uh, you know, if you marry ten wives here, you're going to have ten wives there, but you're going to have access to all the women. And so it's going to be sex glorified forever. It's, I mean, this, that's how stupid it is. It really is because that, I mean, that's what you're teaching. You're teaching this idea that there's going to be a thousand year period of unsaved people. Imagine this. These unsaved people are, are running around having sex with everything and everybody. Well, they might as well have sex with you too, huh? You might as well have sex with them. But there is no sex at the end of the world. Uh, life is going to be so much better than sex. That's the bottom line. Uh, you think sex is the greatest thing? Well, you might want to examine your heart. <clears throat> really, I mean that. I'm, hey, sex is not the greatest thing in the world. Everlasting life in our Lord Jesus Christ in a sinless, perfect world is so much better. Love, true love, is much greater than sex. The truth is much greater than sex. So if you don't want to live in a world without sex, then the kingdom of God is not for you. Okay. So, and I want to make this point, uh, I want to emphasize this point because that's what they're teaching. These guys that are teaching a thousand year period after Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven are teaching there's going to be more sex. Just relax. You're going to keep on having sex. If you're not having sex, then somebody's having sex. And isn't that what it's all about for you guys? Having sex. You don't want sex to end. You want sex to continue after Jesus comes. I mean, really, can I get you to admit that? People are still going to be having sex after Jesus comes. All right, if I can get you to admit that, then maybe it will reveal something about your heart. And, of course, I contend over and over, at the end of the world, when Jesus comes and we are gathered together, there is no more sex. There is no more sin. There is no more death. All the wickedness of this world is going to be done away with forever at that moment. It's finished. All right. There's not a thousand-year period. The zombies running around, people getting their heads cut off, and you and however many women you want are having sex that's not going to happen at all all right so that's really that's all i want to say at this point i want to make it clear that when jesus comes in the clouds of heaven that's it that's the end of the world there is no zombie period where you're having people having sex and then people not able to have sex is I mean just talk about that if that's what you believe I mean really come on man what was the point of Jesus returning if people are still having sex still committing sin still getting married and you're not well I mean what's the point man what is the point and then, of course, again, if there's a thousand-year reign, uh, who takes over when the reign's over? I mean, you might as well just come out and say, hey, Jesus stops reigning. Now it's your turn, right? Mm -hmm. Now he's going to reign. Now he reigns for, what, you get to reign for a thousand years? I mean, the whole argument is just nonsensical, and I don't think people are putting any thought into it at all. Revelation 1, verse 7, Behold, he comes with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen.